My journey starts with big tobacco. When I was a junior in high school in LA, the Lorillar Tobacco Company gave me a college scholarship, oddly enough for not smoking. I felt guilty about using this money for college, and I felt guilty that despite having roots in India, my only exposure to the developing world was my parents telling me to eat all the food on my plate because they were starving children back home. So I used the money to volunteer in Ghana. When I arrived, I learned that I had 60 middle and high school students and only three textbooks. Despite these hardships, my students blew me away. They listened to BBC radio, stayed after class to talk about their favorite books. They were hungry for opportunity. But in a poor corner of rural Ghana, there were few to be had. Here in the US, it's easy to think that we live in a meritocracy, that there's some rhyme or reason to who makes it and who doesn't. But if you happen to be born in a small town in a poor country, good luck. You may be the next Einstein, but because you lost the birth lottery, you'll probably spend most of your life eking out a living. I left Ghana wondering how a country so rich in human capacity could be so poor. And then I got home, and I started receiving letters like this. Dear Sister Lila, I want you to help me with some money, like $50, a calculator, pens. This one was from Richard Yebua, who identifies himself as my only friend. <laughs> Some of the letters asked for bigger ticket items, uh, like a Nintendo Game Boy. <laughs> this one tempered with a drawing of the Bible. <laughs> and, uh, and some even asked for everything I have and said to show me the money. <laughs> I was shocked. These were the same students I'd seen in my classes, students with talent and ambition. What I realized is that they saw a greater opportunity in soliciting help from me than in earning their own money. These letters are symptomatic of a much larger issue, that well-meaning outsiders have created a culture of handouts in so many poor countries. And the sad thing is that asking for them is a rational response to severely limited economic opportunity. The worst thing about poverty is wasted talent. In Africa, over 140 million young people are unemployed or working in low-level jobs and still living in poverty. In India, 130 million surplus workers in rural areas are left behind by the staggering economic growth of the big cities. Work is at the core of human dignity. It's how we define ourselves and our position in the world. So this lack of work represents, in my mind, the biggest threat to global stability. In many parts of Africa, families spend a huge percentage of per capita income on educating one or two children, but unemployment rates coming out of universities can be up to 70%. Young people whose families have begged and borrowed to put them through school end up joining gangs or militia groups that pay them. The expected payoff from crime is higher than from many forms of informal work. Scott Carney wrote a Wired piece this summer on the economics of piracy in Somalia, and he showed that most pirates are fishermen who've traded in their nets for guns because the payoff from ransoms is better than from fishing in their depleted waters. Few of the informal jobs available to the poor take advantage of the education that so many young people now receive. Jobs like making handicrafts, or selling things in local markets, or hawking agricultural produce are not going to catapult people out of poverty in the long run. I'm going to propose that we give poor people more credit. And I'm not talking about microcredit. I'm talking about including them in the future of work, digital work. Digital work includes everything that can be done and delivered using a device with an internet connection, from tagging images, to turning books into text files, to selling real estate on Second Life. It might not sound feasible to use digital work to increase income among the poor, but let me show you why it is. We are witnessing a tremendous surge in human potential. It may not be growing at the pace of Moore's law, but global literacy has risen steadily over the last few decades. And so has access to technology. Computers are popping up everywhere in cyber cafes like this one, which can run on generators and get bandwidth from a satellite dish uh, or a WiMAX tower. This is what Africa's telecommunications backbone looked like in 1983. You can see just a couple of cables on the western side of the continent. And this is what it will look like in 2011. The price for the average Kenyan to get online will decrease by 90% this year due to two new fiber optic cables in East Africa. 
So for many areas too remote to set up a factory or too infertile to grow crops, digital work is a new way to bring much needed capital to the people who need it most. I'm especially excited about a type of digital work, uh, something I call micro work. Micro work includes small tasks that you can do on a smartphone or a cheap computer with an internet connection. One company we heard of generates sales leads in this way. They sell solar panels, and to find out which houses need them, they upload thousands of images of rooftops in San Francisco and ask people to click a button if the rooftop has a visible panel. Microwork taps the cloud, a large group of casual workers who complete tasks worth a couple of cents each. But these small payments can add up to real money uh, for people in need. And I think they also represent the future of work. The major productivity innovation in the 20th century was Ford's assembly line. He figured out a way to break down the making of an incredibly complex machine, the Model T, into small chunks that people with basic training could complete. The assembly lines of the future apply this same thinking to digital work. We now have the ability to use computers to help us break down complex processes and to insert human judgment where computers need help. The future is about humans and computers working together to get stuff done. Just like the opportunities that factory work provided for working class Americans in the last century, micro work will provide opportunities for marginalized people in this one. And we aren't limited to web-based tasks. I see an entire ecosystem evolving. Farmers who today toil away on fields for pennies a day on land they don't own might earn more money tending virtual farms on a social network. Workers could create digital goods such as greeting cards or singing telegrams, the online equivalent of the UNICEF cards that are so popular during the holidays here. In the future, you might send your loved one a virtual flower bouquet, picked by women in Pakistan from Creative Commons images. It is, after all, the thought that counts, and thoughts can be expressed digitally. One of the things that scares me about the cloud concept is that it's easy to forget that there are actual people behind it. So let me introduce you to one of them. This is Paul Parach from southern Sudan. Um, he fled his village at age nine, walked across the border to Kenya, and spent 15 years bouncing around refugee camps. Um, he was also shot in the leg and, and partly paralyzed. I met him this summer when I was in Dadaab, the world's largest refugee site, as part of an experiment to see whether we could get refugees like Paul to do micro work for a Silicon Valley company. Paul spoke English and had gone to high school in the camp, but had only touched a computer about a week before we met him. He was eager to learn. He told me that those lucky enough to get a job in Dadaab earn 50 cents a day. Digital work could earn him double that in an hour. A week after I got home, I had the shock of my life when I got a friend request from Paul on Facebook. <laughs> this young man, who was completely disconnected from the outside world, is now engaging with it, and he's doing so as my peer. So we've broken out of the one-way exchange that characterizes a handout. What people like Paul need most is not our charity. It's a decent way to earn a living. Thank you. <laughs>